Muzaffar Punita yesterday said to me, "You're like a an artwork of uh, which represents ada uh, and form and creativity, and you should be framed and kept." So, what was a creator or an artwork like this representing a old time bygone generation doing in politics? What got you to stand for politics and that too in a constituency? Uh, which had no other than Atal Bihari Vajpayee, who went on to becoming the prime minister of the country. Yeah, yeah, I got it. <clears throat> Actually, it's a very uh, complex question because the first part also is a question which needs an answer. The second part uh, also is a question which needs a different answer. But. Uh, Having said that, I feel that uh, my biggest artwork is Lucknow, you know, which is my inspiration. And I, I mean, I have been you know, regularly concerned about what Lucknow has been, and that's what Zikr is all about. It's the, it's a travelogue through Lucknow and other cities. And as I go through other cities, I'm also uh, being kind of considered as a kind of a custodian of Lucknow. And that's when I felt that something had to be done politically also. It's like my father also fought the first election. And his premise was uh, exactly the same. He stood against the divisive politics that India was thrown into, which is the Hindu Mahasabha and the Congress, you know. Uh, and the Muslim League. So the Musli between the Muslim League and the, Hin and the Hindu Mahasabha, we had to cast a lot. So the same thing, like history repeats itself, I found myself in a situation where I couldn't uh, swallow Lucknow being handed over to the right-wing forces, no matter how sweet they may look on the surface. So I stood up and I fought. M much of your, your younger days, when you were growing up, was spent with magical stories. Well, I think that's how people grow, you know. They, every day there's a story which pushes you ahead, which gives you a little more light on, on things. And uh, <clears throat> Lucknow has been a very, very important place, you know, because it's, it's full of legends, it's full of folklore, it's full of uh, a lot of history, it's full of a lot of culture, it's full of a lot of poetry. So, um, uh, and then there are real life things which are funnier than, uh, than, than these very, very kind of uh, formal subjects like poetry and literature and arts, you know. So I think Lucknow was a very, enriching place for me and even my father he was full of anecdotes he was full of fun he was full of humor and i think i learned to see the funny part in people through him you know and uh, in fact we used to have these uh, lunches or dinners or whatever there, there was always many people at the dining table and at each dining table there would be some stupid fool <laughs> who would make a fool of himself or who was already a fool and we used to enjoy my father's way of very, very courteously taking out that uh, uh, those, sh you know, sh shades of his uh, <laughs> foolishness, and uh, without being, there was nothing rude about it. It was just uh, a way of life, you know. And that's what I saw a lot in Lucknow. And and when you started growing up and you went went off to school. There, of course, rather than this fading bygone era of courtiers, etc., you met a friend of yours who was all into boasting and being really proud and loud, Mohan, who taught you more than a different way of life. Ravindra Mohan, yeah. <coughs> yeah, he was a crazy guy. I mean, he was a total contrast to all the other aristocratic friends I had, you know. And he used to carry, I don't know if there's a real gun or what, he had a gun in his pocket and he had this huge, uh, I mean, his father was a... Studebaker. Yeah, he had a Studebaker. 
and he, and then he had fallen in love with a girl. I don't know whether it was real or mythical, but every day he would come. A Rajput out, girl. Rajput girl. I mean, I think if I tell you in detail, you know who it is. But uh, then one day I heard that he committed suicide. You know. So I think probably Lucknow was too uh, uh, not up to the mark for him. You know? But Lucknow was growing in different ways through you know, after the partition, the kind of people that came to Lucknow, entered Lucknow. It took time for them to change and become mellow and become more Lucknowized, you know, as they now feel. And your love for cars came from your father's love for cars. My love for cars came from toys, and my father had a car which was like larger than life, but it was for me it was a toy because it never worked. It was jacked up in a garage. So when I went to Kutwara, all the village boys and myself would go into that garage, and we would just make a lot of ruckus and noise. We would wash the car, and we would just think that it's as if it's going to take off any minute, you know. And that was what I looked forward to when I went to Kutwara. It was just that huge car, a toy larger than life. And I think there was a lot of uh, nice feelings about it. It had great smell of uh, old aging leather, then congealed mobile oil. All these are, I think, and, and old wood veneer. So these are f very interesting um, as associations I have. And if I became a perfumer or something like that, I would try to recre recreate those uh, wood smells and leather smell and the congealed mobile oil smells. So it gave me a lot. And I think it gave me a lot of talking point with my little village folk, you know. Because somebody was responsible for something, you know. Somebody would do something else. So for me, it was a very big... Um, and then one day, I decided that this car has to work. And it hadn't worked for about... It had done only 19,000 kilometers. But it had been jacked for about 20, 10, 15 years, you know. So what we did was we drained out the engine oil and we... I took out the wheels and I put 20-inch truck wheels on it, you know. <laughs> and I got all the bullock carts from my village to pull it down to Lucknow, you know. And there I had a very good mechanic. He said, I'll take it. So he really fixed it, but I mean, not to the um, kind of conquest standards. <laughs> But still, it was fun. And you drove it around? I drove it, yeah. And then later in the book, of course, you talk about not quite wanting to sell it, not quite selling it, but it did leave your possession. Yeah, but I think it's, I bought it and it's kept in my mind. I did a painting of that also. I mean, these things are all metal and iron and what. They, they don't have any kind of... Uh, what shall I say? Temporal value, you know? So. Um, but the guy who took it from you was a bit of a crook. No, it went through several people. The first person was a crook. The second person, third, second person was a bigger crook. And the person who's got it after that was also a crook. And finally, the person who has it now is a. He's like a saint, you know what I mean? He now says, Ke, Your father's car, your father's car, your father's car. So I'm enjoying that state of um, having my father's car restored to the restored to the finest standards you know and what got you to calcutta filthy lucre but i didn't want to compromise on uh, on my this thing my father wanted me to get a job of, of a different kind actually my father i uh, as a just hold it like that because it, i think that yeah so, no, my father wanted me to study science. I went to Aligarh to study science. There I was exposed to a very different kind of a questioning poetry, you know. And that kind of questioning poetry, I think, is very rare. I, mean, I was very lucky to be in the midst of those people who were inspired by Fez Ahmed Fez and the other revolutionary poets who had just witnessed the partition and questioned the partition. So it made me a different kind of a thinking, romantic person. And then from there, I wanted to 
obviously stand on my feet. And, uh, and uh, in fact, Galigar, going to Aligarh made a world of difference to me because it got me totally, what shall I say? Uh, Independent of the trappings that purged, you were part of. Purged of any aristocratic moorings, you know. So then I wanted to go and be as near as art at the same time earn a little money. So I got into advertising and fortunately the company I was with had people like Mr. Ray and other very prominent. And Saida Imam. Saida Imam and Subhash Mukhopadhyay, again a brilliant poet in Bengali which I didn't understand. But adver <laughs> advertising at that point of time, Muzaffar must have been alien to most people, especially whether it's Aligarh or Lucknow or your father in Kotwara. I mean, what, 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 did, did he never sort of say, you know, what are you doing? No, I think for me, yeah, that was the first question. But once I got into it and I found an answer for that, I found it a very empowering thing. In advertising, you don't say no to anything. You say, yes, it can be done. I mean, if you were having problems marketing this uh, Jaipur Literature Festival in here, I would say, I'll do it for you, you know. And we'll work out strategies and this and that and God knows what. All that is uh, done to make a fool of you. But I enjoyed it. I think it was a great uh, experience to be part of that thought process. And in fact, that was leading me to, towards a kind of a, uh, a journey questioning myself, questioning where I was coming from, where I wanted to go. So I think all these things were happening to me uh, in a very organic, uh, systematic, yet uh, unplanned way. And you loved Calcutta. Oh, yeah. Cal Calcutta gave me a lot of um, full-blooded nostalgia. You know, I live with, because I think each home, each person, each... I mean, when people talk Bengali, I, I go into some kind of a uh, orgasm, you know, because it's beautiful language, you know. So, and that's what I think language does to me. I don't understand anything, but I go into feelings, you know. And it and it's in Calcutta that you met Geeti, your first wife. Yeah. She also came from a very interesting... Her father was the head of ICICI, I think. No, no, no. no. no, no. Her, father, her father was a big doctor in, in Delhi. He was the doctor to Rabindranath Tagore. In fact, Tagore named her Geeti. And her ma mother was the daughter of Charulata Mukherjee, whose her brother was uh, Air Marshal Mukherjee. So it was a very... I mean, it, it had a... F uh, I mean, the most interesting background a person could have uh, to be uh, called a Bengali, you know, Brahmos, they were. So I think uh, that definitely attracted me to her, more the, uh, the, the, the romance of the Bengal. But were you a man up out uh, around town? I mean, being from Aligarh, from Lucknow, was, were you a shy person? Were you, I'm going to woo every woman out here? Actually, I always felt I was a nobody, you know what I mean? And that's, I think, my power. To feel like I don't belong. I mean, I belong there. That is for me. But for people, I mean, I'm, I should be self-effacing. People should know who I am. And that's, I think, what makes me attracted to a place. I don't want to, I will never be attracted to a place if people say, oh, this is so-and-so. And I, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very reticent, very shy. I don't make the first move, you know. So that's what, uh, in fact, when I was in Calcutta, I realized that, okay, all said and done, I had to be something. And that's when I decided I should be a painter, you know. And I got into painting in a very intense kind of way. I had one small room, half of this size. Uh, and your cook uh, used to uh, sleep in the yeah, veranda. To, yeah, and there was a studio of mine. So either I was painting or I was entertaining. And there was a cupboard which divided the kitchen and the studio and my bed. So <coughs> it, uh, I think, um, because everybody around me was a poet or a filmmaker or something or the other. So I said, I have to, I think I've got something in me. 
and what is it that I have? So I kept questioning myself, but I, then I realized that you know, I was always very good at painting. I used to get my class, class art prize, you know. So at least uh, on that competitive level, I had been recognized by my school. So I pursued that. And I had my first exhibition in Calcutta in 1968 uh, at the Gallery of uh, Fine Arts, um, Academy of Fine Arts. Academy. Yeah, Lady Ranu Mukherjee inaugurated the exhibition. And slowly that gave me a new identity, a new circle of friends. And uh, it made me realize that uh, you can see other things also as a painter. You could find yourself a place in poetry as a painter. And slowly find your place in cinema as a painter. So that, and I saw Mr. Ray used to sketch all his uh, films. That again, I mean, in, uh, empowered me that as somebody who's good with his fingers, he could create images, images that were more than images, images that could move on screen, images that would move people. So that, <coughs> what I felt was that was a kind of a, a change that I was experiencing in Calcutta. And I'm sure no other city would have offered me that. But you were also a poet, right? You also wrote. No, no. Wrote, I'm, no. I'm just poetry-headed, you know what I mean? I'm not at all a poet. And I'm, I was told by a very close friend of mine, don't write poetry if you can find good poetry to read, you know? Azhar <laughs> Vajahat. And I stuck to that, I think. And I'm very fortunate that I stuck to that. Because if I'd started writing poetry, I would be indulging in my own poetry, and I would not see um, the world outside. Yeah, the, 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 the world of many, many poets who have inspired me. For those of you who don't know Calcutta, so in the 60s and the 70s and even earlier, if you weren't creative and you were in Calcutta, you know, you couldn't exist. If you were a Bengali, I'm a Bengali. So you're supposed to have been born DNA. Your DNA is creation and creativity. And exactly. the pressure to be creative in Calcutta is always quite, or used to be, fairly. <clears throat> but you know, slowly you realize that there, you are, that art is being transferred through love. There and through food in your case. Nee, nee, in this, ha, that I was giving them mm, love through food. But what I was getting is that through my art, I was getting respect, you know what I mean? I wouldn't have got that kind of respect anywhere <laughs> else. Because the art... The Bengali is very, very sensitive to uh, creation, creation and creativity. You know, he respects you. And you would advocate that every young person seeking a career must have a good chef. I, he must have a good chef and he must also live in, a bit in Calcutta. <laughs> <laughs> so, Muzaffar, you then got a calling to head to Bombay, to Air India. You got a call from Air India and off you went to see whether this was the place that you should go to. I, there was an interim period of, uh, of uh, Delhi, and when I went there, that was also a very interesting thing, which is given in my book. But I met a lot of people. You see, my, uh, the, the interesting thing about my life is the kind of people I have met, and how I have opened up to them, and how they opened up to me, and how they gave me what they gave me, you know. Because I think of my very self-effacing nature, because they would... Otherwise, people get very closed if the other person is, has an agenda or is too, uh, you know, pushing himself for this thing. So that, uh, the Delhi of that time was a very interesting time. There were people like Popul Jaikar, Kamala Devi, Chattopadhyay, and there were a lot of very brilliant minds there. But anyway, I had to find my own space in life. And I got a job in uh, Air India in 1970. And that job really uh, was a very, it opened, I mean, it was totally a, a, a big contrast to Calcutta. The only thing common about uh, the job was that it had this kind of uh, um, connection with advertising. But otherwise, Air India itself was in a, is a different world. And I was a very small cog in the wheel, but fortunately, my bosses were very 
they 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 liked me and they gave me a lot of opportunities to explore and do things you know but you really made a mark and much of the art that air india then went on to buy was something that you were also involved in see air india gave me so much opportunities i mean i can't tell you we even the whole uh, game plan of air india was to market first india and after with marketing india the seats will sell you know and these people had the imagination to do that like designing the maharaja so mr bobby kuka was my boss and uh, he uh, in fact uh, there is some talking going on can you stop talking behind us guys at the back neha so so uh, we uh, we needed to present the best of india in terms of art in terms of music in terms of dance in terms of uh, textiles so i mean that was what we felt was the our creative strategy to market uh, the airline you know and i think it was a very unusual um, strategy but in that same process we uh, we were also marketing the tehzeeb you know the hospitality the courtesy the you know when the person i mean air india is basically about was at that time i didn't i don't know what is left it was how well you are greeted and how well you are cared how well you are looked after so we were taught i mean we all these things uh, to be able to attract the customer what was fascinating then is that in air india you also trained every pilot every stewardess every hostess on the flight to behave in a particular manner well not just the not the pilots and all they knew what to do but the in flight uh, attendants and the in flight people they were i mean we obviously designed the dresses their sarees their whole this thing i mean i was just a uh, one of the people and uh, but it certainly gave me an outlook you know and the biggest thing which where i could add value was the painting part because being a painter uh, i could uh, i could spot good art modern art and at that time people had strange uh, some fuddy duddy parsis had strange notions of what indian art could be like you know and there i could break out of that and sell them the idea of buying a gaithonde or a much of the progressive one. artists was acquired in that time yeah tayyab mehta and, and at what price and it was at that time very very low prices i think it, uh, i think you bought a tayyab mehta in 3000 1500 and 3000 rupees like that, you know? which recently went on auction for 6.5 million dollars uh, so at least what i feel is that air india gave me an opportunity to exercise my eyes you know what i mean and i could have done more also so so when did film start now appearing you were in air india you had already started thinking film you were running off in in bit in between bits when you had leave and you started trying to see whether you could see, make your first see the point is film. that air india couldn't change my inner dna you know and my inner this thing was abad lucknow and that's what i had learned from mr ray is to be is to present your own culture through celluloid like nobody has done bengal you know so i thought to myself can't uh, i do abad because abad is being taken by bollywood and may remains off i think i should be able to <coughs> be, be able to create an abad of my own imagination of my own dreams untouched by the bollywood uh, ugliness you know what i mean i mean for me bollywood was a nightmare you know so uh, but being in but being in bombay you were pretty much steeped in bollywood as well because that no. was your advertising you went off to shoot your first ad film uh, yeah on, but on I, i was above that you know in the sense ke i didn't depend on that was i in bollywood i would have been knocked around and uh, would have had to you know pata nahi kya what i i would have had to do you know but i was protected in air india and i was protected pretty well because in the job i was i could oblige anybody with anything 
I could give free tickets as much as I wanted. I could do so much, you know. I mean, obviously within uh, logic and limits. So that way, I mean, that Air India didn't stop my own creative uh, journey, you know. And my own creative journey was really back to the roots, back to my village, back to the helplessness of my people of the village, what my father thought of that, how he wanted people in his own village not to uh, starve, to be well clothed. So that is what uh, drove me inside, you know. So when I was sitting in the Air India building on the 18th floor, I would look at that taxi driver below me under the rain, in the, in the sun, in the heat, and I was wondering what the hell was that man doing. Then I would get into his taxi and go here and there, go back home. And I would just think, what is making him tick? Why is he here? It's not a good life to sit under the heat and in the rain 2,000 kilometers away from your home. So this drove me to my first film, Gaman. And in this and through this, I found poetry. And that poetry became so, which I had got from Alikara, you know. Thank God I didn't write poetry, otherwise I would have written a lot of rubbish. So, uh, that poetry gave me a new way of looking at the predicament of the dispossessed. So, I think the art, my art has been driven by the predicament of the dispossessed. All my paintings, uh, paintings, though it's not so visible, but paintings give you a kind of a aesthetic framework to put uh, your pain. But definitely, your moving images does, you know. And, and one of the things that you said to us yesterday was that you made Gaman in 300,000 rupees. And this was in 1977, 78? 78, yeah. Uh, 78. So, 300... I mean, how, 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 how could you manage to make a full feature film in this kind of money? Who I didn't was, you pay? I was very scared. I thought I might spend the money before the film is made. Buy so, another car. Buy? I said buy another car. With I could do that also. <laughs> because passion is passion, you know. But what happened, we all traveled second class sleeper, unreserved. Should see pictures of that time. And even Smita Patil went uh, unreserved. You were, you were waiting anxiously yeah. that would she show up at the station. And we all stayed in Kudwara in my house. Uh, so every there was in Tahir who used to cook in Calcutta was cooking for them, and he was my greatest PR person. So any kind of discomfort they had would be softened by the food. You know, I think food is a great softener. <laughs> then in Bombay also, I uh, I was actually had an Air India house. So that house was full of taxi drivers. You know, the whole ground floor there were about six seven taxi drivers just sitting there, chilling out before we go for a shoot, you know. Because I used a lot of real people in the film. So, I think uh, that is what made uh, my kind of a Air India journey and this journey through films, two different journeys at the same time. And, and that once that bug bit you, your gaman bug, making that first film, you were able to make it, complete it, what then? Were you immediately started thinking about the next? Because you were still working in Air India. It was only in the middle of Umrao Jan did you have to leave. Yeah, but I mean, I found uh, working with these Parsis very easy. You know, they said, "Oh, he can do it in his holidays." You know, so I thought okay, at least that holiday angle is not bad. You know, I can. So while I was if working, if you weren't a Nawabi, Karabi, Sharabi type, would they have had the same attitude? Was it who you were? The, 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 the fact that the Parsi sort Parsi. of, you know, indulged you, which they did. Yeah, but they indulged me on, on not their own money, you know. <laughs> they, 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 they State were, money, it's uh, easier. But they, they're quite calculating if it's their own money, you know. So, uh, they, I don't know, I have not met a very, very generous uh, Nawabi Parsi, you know. I've met, you know, philanthropic Parsis, but uh, that I think maybe they do it for tax purposes also. And for, for a name also. But real Nawabi Parsis, I don't think they are. But they are fun. They allow you to 
lead a bindas life, and, but they judge you, you know, they, they won't let anybody else behave like me. I mean, they probably understood that uh, this guy is not going to uh, sell them. Well, we can't contain this guy, so let him <laughs> do what he, what he wants to do. In fact, the interesting thing about the book is, you know, the first part of it, it's pretty much like a film. It's, it's, it's a slow sort of development. And then when you get to your film part with this Gaman and then actually Umbrao Jan, you pour your heart out and you see the passion in the words and the writing. How did Umbrao Jan come into being and how did you find Rekha and her eyes? Rekha and her eyes. Her eyes found me out. <laughs> actually, uh, Umbrao Jan was all about, uh, again, the, the lost Avad and the beauty of the lost Avad, you know, which was everything that Umrah Jan is all about, you know. And to find that lost Avad through a classic novel was not a joke, you know, because I, I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm very lazy about reading, you know, so I read it once, but the a novel has to be read many times for it to become. Uh, larger than life, you know. So I got one lady, um, Salma Siddiqui, who had a very, very other Lucknow accent to read it. And I used to had a little Fiat in which there was a cass uh, cassette player and I'm going to office and back, I would just, I think in a day I used to hear it four times. So Umrajan began to become a kind of, uh, uh, what shall I say, breath. I used to breathe Umrah Jan, you know. And through that I could uh, see uh, summers, winters, change of seasons, change of light. So that's where my artistic mind worked. Because it was spa uh, sparking uh, visual images uh, connected with nostalgia, you know what I mean? Which is easy to, not easy, I'm saying, which is also done in when people write literature. but to be able to take it and absorb it and uh, define it through cinematic images and then I had to sketch it out also. So that was one layering of the preparation. The second layering of the preparation was really the poetry because I had to create a, again, as I said, uh, the journey of this girl, you know, a journey of a dispossessed. Uh, this dispossessed is 100 years later than Gaman, earlier than Gaman. But it is a story of the dispossessed, the angst of the helpless. So now, to, to be able to uh, make this person a creative person and set it in that culture, poetry was very important. Because poetry in that culture, in those times, was a means of survival. If you were not a poet, if you couldn't sing, if you couldn't dance, sold to a, a, a courtesan's home, you will be thrown out, you know what I mean? So now to use that as a kind of a trajectory to define the character was a, uh, was a very kind of a cerebral, subliminal task. And I, I'm so happy I had uh, a companion like uh, Shahriyar who used to actually teach Umrao Jan in Arigarh. So when, and I, you know, this is a, the book is full of poetry, but I didn't want to use that poetry. I wanted to now restructure uh, the whole f narrative, you know. And that's when the poetry began. But, but unlike in the taxi in Gaban, where you spoke with many uh, taxi drivers and sort of up and out them, you didn't necessarily do that with all the courtesan women. You didn't visit every brothel. No, or no. Or did you? No. <laughs> I can go now. <laughs> but there's nothing left. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they'll throw me Even off. if you pay them, I, I don't, I don't uh, think that's going to work. But tell me, the music, you know. The, I could make films for three lakhs. Now <laughs> you go to one place. <laughs> the music of Umrao, you know, I, I don't know whether when you were making it, you realized that it would become one of these iconic films with this iconic music and you used uh, you used one of the uh, music directors you used in Gaman uh, uh, Jaraj to be able to also come on board but the music is so 
uh, evocative, it's so powerful, and even 40 years or whatever years after Umrao, it's, it still continues to play across every radio station and sits in your head. Actually, the beauty of filmmaking is uh, collective creativity, in which you are the driver. At the same time, nobody knows that who's the driver. So, to be able to create that kind of music, you needed people who are possessed by the idea, you know. And that's the first step was the poet, the writer, the words that, are, that were going to be spoken, and then the music director. And my, I, first I took Jaydev, you know, but he didn't somehow... Um, he was probably not going through the right period of his life, you know. So I took Khayyam Sam, and between Shahriyar, Khayyam and myself, we created the music over one and a half years or something like that, which is the, not done in Bombay. You know. People take a... So the, the, I think the more detailed work you do, the more cerebral the output would be, you know, and that's what I re learned. And I took filmmaking jobs as much bigger challenges than people normally do. I mean, people take filmmaking jobs today as how much you can spend on it, on CG and sets and all that. I take filmmaking jobs as what, how much time I can spend on it. I take time to frame a picture. I sit there with the monitor or whatever it is, and I keep, I let the image of the frame talk to me. Then I realize, okay, okay it's, it's, this is what it's doing, but it may be if the light came this way, or maybe if the camera moved and encompassed this kind of a bo body language, it would say something more, you know. And suddenly you'll find that a new world has opened to you. So that is what filmmaking does, you know. It's can, it goes into so many zones, you know what I mean? And, and there is a truth, uh, Muzaffar, in the fact that when you have uh, limited resources, you actually become far more creative because then it's not just about ordering up stuff, but it's also about trying to figure what you can do in these limited resources. I think my, I look at resources as my um, extension of my wanting to do something and getting people to do it for me, you know, not what I can buy, you know, because I think that's what makes it a lot of difference to have your cameraman or your lighting person or your actors understand the the the, the kind of uh, uh, ambience that is being created cannot be done with money, you know what I mean? And. In all of this, you decided that you would have to act. Rekha, who was already a pretty celebrated actor, how did she agree and how did she go into the entire training process where she was able to now the essence of Umrao? See, uh, when I had, when, when we cast Rekha, there was some, something that drew us, you know, which I've tried to describe in some strange way. But uh, once we got Rekha... And you weren't intimidated with her when you first went to see her? No, I mean intimidated could have only been because she would say no. And uh, I had taken somebody like uh, Shama Zaidi who would make anybody say no to anything. <laughs> anyway, she, uh, but somehow, you know, Rekha bought the idea before I could sell it. And she was just amazing in every aspect I mean, of it. When you buy something, like say, love at first sight, I mean, also, so such people also don't disclose that they've bought it, you know what I mean? And that whole decision of having bought the idea, it takes, it reveals to you in layers, you know, through their commitment, through what they do, through what, you know, how much time they would give you to, to dub, you know, because her, she's from Tamil Nadu, she's a Tam Ram, you know. And uh, she said, I do it in one day, dubbing puri. It's like, how much is it? But when we went there, it took about 10, 15 days to dub her. In Walaji studio. So, you had to work with her breath. You had to work with her voice. You had to work with 
But that is what is the beauty of uh, Indian cinema, Urdu cinema, I would say, that you are creating a magic in sound. Cerebral magic. Uh, and I think this, this day and age, is, people don't deserve it. They don't know what the hell it's all about, you know. And your love for music continued even after this film. Again, I'll come back towards the end about whether you ever thought that the film was going to be such a huge success. But your love for music continued and back in Delhi, you then created a platform for some amazing Sufiana music. See, once you're bitten by the music bug, again, you know, it's like poetry. I don't write poetry. So I don't create music. You know? But uh, there's something in me that drives a musician. And this is something that a lot of musicians who've worked with me will tell you. Because I totally surrender at that moment and I let, uh, I try to create a kind of a cycle between the singer and the song and the music and, the, and me, you know what I mean? And then I think many, many times and it, it's something magical, you know what I mean? So when I came back from Kashmir, couldn't do Zuni or whatever it is, it's, that's also given in the book, you know. It's a, it's a very interesting, actually, journey of an artist or, or a, what shall I say, a wanderer. So um, I've realized that uh, this country needed a, a very spiritual renaissance, you know. Right? I mean, I couldn't, again, we go back to fundamentalism, we go back to intolerance, we go back to human behavior. And I felt what uh, was happening in Kashmir was horrible, you know. And, but at the same time, all I, the gift I got from Kashmir, I mean, one tragedy was that I couldn't finish the film, but the gift I got was the, was the huge cache of Sufiana music. How Rumi, Saadi, Khosro, they lived in these khanqas and how that music was divided between the rags and the maqams of, of Persian maqams and how that music floated on the, on, on the lake and how it, it was something else, you know, that whole revolution of music. So when I came back from there, I came to Delhi and I realized, that where have I come? This is a city of saints. And from then on, I started looking at Delhi as a city of saints. I mean, I did find Saint some... Saint meaning people with business interests more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, I didn't... So I, for, for me, they didn't exist, you know. For me, only the saints existed and what they had written existed and what a creative artist could do in their presence. So, as a filmmaker, I tried to create a spectacle in a ruin called jahan e Khusro. And I was very fortunate to have worked with Abda Parveen. I had done a CD with her called Raksa Bismil, which is still, I think, a very soulful rendering of Sufiana Kalam, you know. But Jahan e Khusro was something that was a melting pot for world music. I got musicians from Turkey, Uzbekistan, from Bangladesh, from everywhere. And I would, my, premise was to was to rehearse with them you know and present them in a kind of a seamless way you know you know we're running out of time but i wanted to quickly ask you one is after you finished umrao jaan and you know it was a success did it become easier because umrao jaan was made in what an equivalent of thirty thousand dollars at that point you started with zuni and your other projects was it easier to raise money for what? To do your next project, in this case, uh, Zuni? No, that, see, Zuni, I've, if you read the book, you'll find how Zuni came about and why it came about and, and how it actually, uh, Mary McFadden came in, into the picture and how it could have been or would have been a, a global project, you know, and how it would have been very, very important for, for the valley to have a, film which encompasses their culture and the four seasons, you know. So that 
found a taker in the government of Kashmir. You know? So they gave me a kind of a bank guarantee, which they didn't fulfill because insurgency started. You know? But anyway, I, I've done films. I mean, I've done a lot of smaller films and documentaries and all that. But Before we open it up, Muzaffar, is it... I mean, in today's sort of environment, and we know that today's environment is very challenging, especially if you're an artist uh, and you come from a minority community. Are you feeling hemmed in? Obviously, I can't dream big, you know. I am meant to be a big dreamer, you know what I mean? So, so I can only judge a ecosystem by the scale of my dream. And do you place yourself as being eccentric or just crazy? <laughs> Mad. On that happy note of mad, any questions in the house? Uh, nine. Five. It's good. Yeah. Um, a kind of a double question. You mentioned working, uh, or at least encountering Satyajit Ray in your advertising days. Um, and the, the fact that Bengal, maybe Calcutta in particular, was a kind of a hotbed of creative activity in the 60s and 70s. I wondered firstly if you had any personal impressions of Ray that you would care to share, and also whether you have any theories about why uh, that particular time and that particular place were a center for so much creative ferment. I'm interested in why some places spring up like that and others are quite the opposite. See, Calcutta at that time was uh, a very cosmopolitan place, you know. It had a lot of uh, people from these big managing agencies, a lot of English people who were actually, a lot of them have gone and they were going at that time. But I had some very, very close friends who, and then even Mr. Ray was exposed to uh, a lot of French influences. And uh, so Calcutta definitely was, uh, uh, was a melting pot of ideas. And I used to just watch Mr. Ray. Uh, I mean, I was just an observer in his life, you know. I mean, I, I had somebody who would, who, had, who was privy to his life and would take me there. And I would just stand there like that. And I would just, do, he would show me how he, <coughs> he was creating a character with, on, on, the, on his drawing board. Then how he would uh, create music on his piano. <coughs> That's the time when I realized that maybe I had the, my, my, then had the facility to be able to create characters. <coughs> and also, I mean, I had the poetic mind and the ear to understand music and uh, take it to another level through, po through poetry, you know. And also the context of Calcutta, you must remember when it became the sort of center of British India and just pre that as well for 300 years, you primarily had all of the uh, Zamindari families or the, or the ruling class of Calcutta uh, providing platforms for artists across the spectrum. And that became the sort of melting pot of the nationalism mov movement against the British, also the advent of education and information, the social ref reformist movement against Sati uh, which was, you know, where you burn yourself. If your husband has died, you throw yourself on the pyre. So all of them came from that because it became the capital in many ways. It was the British capital for a while till it shifted to, to Delhi. And the Viceroy sat there and commerce was primarily Calcutta. So all the bankers from Rajasthan also came there and funded all of the wars and all of the trials and tribulations. So it was a particular kind of place. And the Anglo-Indian community who was, who 
stayed on so the Anglo-Indian community is if you had an offspring from a British person and an Indian person, typically you were not seen as being white or British. So you had a second class sort of whatever. You weren't looked at on by the zamindars as anybody to deal with. So you joined the railways or whatever. But that community of the Anglo-Indians also then fashioned a whole new uh, class and cultural awareness and system. So uh, uh, the jazz standards, etc., was you know was was all of that. It broke from classical and traditional culture in many ways and created this new wave and the whole club life that Calcutta was known for, continues to be known for, emerged out of some of this, and therefore it was seen to be the cultural capital of India for a very long time. And it had an ecosystem where uh, a lot of English people were, were finding themselves comfortable there, and they could be creative, they could be appreciative of art. And I had a lot of such friends, which I've tried to describe in this. Uh, Tony Mayer. Yeah, and it was also the movie capital. Most movie people from the old world were in Calcutta. And then they moved to Bombay and to create what we now know as... Uh, and all the lot of English people, I mean, who were my friends, like Tony Mayer, who was married to the Bardwan daughter. Then people like uh, Peter Leggett, who was the heir of the Inchgrave group. In fact, he, they goaded me to do my exhibition. They went and booked my hall. They pushed me. And in fact, they were very responsible for even marketing what I had done. You know, they made sure a lot of people came and so. But what I'm saying is that Calcutta was a very inspirational place at every level. And it's also one of the few places that even if you're very poor, you can get by, and you're very rich, you get by. So, you know, it's all of that. Any, any other question? Kabir wanted to. Uh, Muzaffar, you mentioned to me in one of your conversations that uh, you were still thinking of Zuni as a project that might uh, continue to have a life in the future. Um, could you, or would you want to talk about that? Yeah, briefly, I mean, I can touch upon the idea. Because, you know, in such discussions uh, in certain kind of forums have led me, or had, has led the audience to ask the Zuni question. You know? Why couldn't it be made, and why it cannot be made? <coughs> so I think this uh, Zikr poses questions. It's, uh, it poses questions to why I couldn't do this, why this couldn't be done. And that's, I think, to me, it's a very healthy f format to present my life in, you know. So Zuni, the kind of uh, work I had done in Zuni and the kind of commitment I had got from people, how can it be done is a, another creative challenge. It could be done all over again. It could be done... Uh, as a kind of a dialogue between um, Dimple and myself. Because I went and saw her and I felt that people are very emotional about what they've done in the film. Extremely emotional. And even Asha mostly has done some exceptional singing in that. So how it can be done is, a, is something that I, mean, I think we'll have to... Uh, think very seriously and uh, get proper commitments from people as to how it can be done. But you also have every scene that's drawn and maybe it'll find a different way of coming to life through a book. I started doing paintings of, of uh, I thought if at least I can, because I had got a, you know, my, I, whatever I've done, I've always kept photographers with me. And in photographers of international standard. So there was a couple of photographers working with me, Sam Haskins, then uh, Ben Ingham. And Ben has taken hundreds of photographs of the film. And I've also done a lot of sketches of the film. So there's a lot of interesting visual documentation of the evolution of the film. The same thing is with the Rumi. I've done about 200 sketches of the Film. So, I mean, I'm always traveling 
in one medium through many mediums. You know what I mean? So I'm not, uh, but the thread is the same, you know? So. Yeah, did I, did I, did I answer you? Somewhat. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. can only be answered somewhat, you know? Somewhat. No, I was actually Read the book. just asking any unfulfilled dream of yours, Muzaffar, apart from Zuni. <laughs> <laughs> you unfulfilled last dream wishes. of Muzaffar, last wishes. Nahi, jo ho jayo, that's good enough. I mean, the fact is that it's reached where it has reached. I think in India, what is the, the sad part is that people don't have a sense of record. Things have to be recorded even if they're incomplete, you know. I mean, I saw a very beautiful book called the film, The, the Greatest Film Never Made, you know. So, I mean, they've gone into so much detail of wow, the preparation and, uh, and what goes into making a film. Because it's a tactile, physical, uh, multi-artistic, disciplinary journey, you know what I mean? And uh, I think uh, on one hand, the technology is moving so fast. On the other hand, uh, there is no place to... Uh, like I have shot 70 cans, so there is 70,000 feet of the film. Out of that, uh, 20,000 has been destroyed, you know, because of the lab. And now there is no lab who can uh, look after the negative. <laughs> so I think this journey from ce celluloid to the digital media is, is another serious uh, thing that needs to be considered in terms of uh, what shall I say? So I think if things are recorded well, then at least you feel, okay, ha, I've done this, it's there now. Take it or leave it, you know. But it's very sad to say, okay, I've done this, but you don't know where it is. And you can't see it, you know. That shouldn't be there. Mira had that look when you said, na, any unfulfilled dreams, other things, oh my God, here we go again. How are we going to cope with this? And by the way, happy anniversary to both of you. You all had your anniversary yesterday, 32nd, 34th, 35th, 30th. You don't remember. She does. It's okay. But happy anniversary and thank you both for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, Muzaffar Ali, his book Zikra. Do you want to say what Zikra means? Many people want. Zikra. Zikra means uh, to talk about something. It's Conversation, got, dialogue. It's, uh, it's mention of things, you know, like... In fact, that title was given by my publisher. <coughs> and I was wondering, who would understand Zikr? So this Penguin girl, she said, Nani, it sounds very good. So then I thought and thought and thought. And then we just added that in the light and shade of time. So at least it qualifies the, 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 the nature of Zikr. Certainly better than Guftagu. So Zikr, Zikr is fine. Thank you all.